Since my time here on YouTube the last three to four years, I've had a lot of questions from a lot of great people. One of the most common, and it seems to be a recurring thing, is how do you read plants? It's not that hard to understand why people don't know how. In construction, you want to build out this team. You want to build out a team that is rock solid and can take on any task. When you finally dial that team in well enough to where they know everything they need to do, oftentimes the people that want to move up and learn more get stuck in that position they're in because what they have works. You'll have a great lead that can run a great crew, but the people that are on the bottom rarely come up. They rarely learn how to read plans. They don't ever really step into that lead position. In the last couple years, we've done some awesome plan reading videos. They've gotten great responses. It's helped a lot of you guys out. But when it comes to construction documents, there is never too much to know. Today's video is sponsored by Connex Jobs. We're going to go over a couple different things when it comes to reading plans. Stay tuned for that. Connex Jobs has a program available online that is fantastic to use for new construction. Prior to 2018, 2019, I would have a paper set of plans and go through and try to add up everything on a little notebook and it never really worked out. I would miss a couple of things and all of a sudden we're short material. I would overestimate and we'd have way too much, which is never really a problem. But the being short isn't ever fun. And when it comes to bidding projects such as rough framing or siding or roofing, you want to be as accurate as you can be to where you can be competitively priced. For those of you that have been around the channel for a little bit, you know that we don't do the one and done partnerships. Connex is a program that I've been using for a bit now. So let's dive into this video, teach you a little bit about reading plans. This is for rough framing only. It's what we're going to go in depth on, but you can take away quite a bit from this video if you just follow along. For the safety of my client, I am going to be blocking out the right hand side of the plan set. All it shows there is their first name, last name, and their street address. Now we've got the plans open here on Connex. I'm going to flip through them, show you guys a little bit about them, talk to you guys about the project, and explain what is going on. So I have the plan set open here on the left hand side. You can see every page all the way through. We're going to be on page one. This is the best page for you to get as much information as you can without diving fully into the project. The first page that you're going to see is called a title sheet. What this is going to do is inform you on the project and show you what's going on. Sometimes they'll include the site plan on there, which shows the overall site. Sometimes they won't. This one here has a quick little snippet of the site plan, shows you all the information, the product data, sheet index, project statistics, everything else, green building code notes, and more. The title sheet is basically there to give you a rundown on what the project consists of. It'll tell you the square footage of the new building. It'll tell you the lot size and much more. So on this project here, up in the top right hand corner, you can see the street address, which is blurred out. You can see the lot size, 6,581 square feet. Then you can see the project description. Just by reading this, you can get an idea of what the project's going to look like. It says here, build two 1390 square foot residential units. Now you wouldn't know if they're attached or not until you get a little bit further down. The north unit is 660 square foot downstairs, 730 upstairs, 326 for garage, and the south unit is the exact same. On the construction type there, it says VB. I will have a link in the description down below to all the different construction types where you can check that out. VB simply means it's an unprotected wood frame, single family residence, or detached garage. A VA is more of a commercial residence or a big multifamily. Sprinklers below that means we have to have fire sprinklers in this project. Just about every project in California now has them. We have a building height of 29 foot. And then there on the bottom, we have R3 for the occupancy. That right there is a multifamily or a grouped home. Now check this out real quick. Just like if you're reading a book back in elementary school, you have what we call a sheet index. This is going to give you a solid rundown on everything you're dealing with. A1 is our site plan and general notes. C1 is our drainage plan, A2 is floor plan, all the way down. That's going to give you everything you need. When we build new construction homes for just rough framing, I print out all of our S's and A's, all of our architectural and structural sheets. I can build just about anything off of those. So that's a pretty good rundown of what a site plan is, shows you some basic info. If you have a set of plans at home, just flip through them and read them. The amount of things you can learn just by reading a set of plans is insane. Now, since there is no formal title sheet on this project, we just have a site plan. It shows you what the project's going to look like. If you guys haven't watched the duplex project, I highly suggest you do. It was one heck of a project. We had one foot of setback on both sides, as you can see there, and it got tight. But that gives you an idea of what the project looks like. Parking space on both sides, garage, garage, 
if you get a formal title sheet, like I said, this project didn't have one, you will have a list of everybody on site. You won't have your subcontractors listed on there, but your general contractor, your architect, your engineer, whoever's doing all your third party inspections, everyone will be listed on there. All their contact info as well. So in the case you need to contact somebody, that's where you do it. The sheet index on that title sheet showed us exactly what's going to be in this plan set. We're on page two, that is architectural still, that is our floor plan. Let's talk about what we would use this for. When you have an architect and engineer that work together on a project to make sure that everything goes smooth, the project will be a breeze. When they don't collaborate and they both take a shot in the dark, that's when your project will be real fun. In the case you have a project where the architect and the engineer's drawings don't match up, but one needs to happen, take the engineer's side. Architects make things look great, engineers make things work. So we've got our floor plan. This is the lower floor plan. We use these pages for quite a bit. We use them for all of our window and door layouts. We use this for all of our plating before we do our rough framing. From corner of building to the pop out for the stairs, everything is listed here, labeled with all the dimensions. Pulling our numbers for the slab to make sure that everything's correct. Let's give you a quick example of that. From the corner of building here to this pop out, we should have around 12 feet. And then from here, this 10 foot 10 over to here, and then 10 foot 6 butting that wall, the corner there. We would pull those numbers in person on the concrete slab to make sure that everything was correct. So if you pulled outside here to outside here, and it was only 10 foot 8, you know that that is 2 inches short, something's not right there. When we build, we double check all these numbers and make sure that everything was done correctly. One thing that this set of plans is missing is normally they will give you a line that looks a little something like this through the center of your window. And they will give you a number to it. What this is is a number to center of window to where you can pull off of the corner of building six foot six to the center of a 2650 window. This was the first set of plans in a long time that I've worked on that don't have those numbers, don't have the dimensions for you for your center of all your openings. It's just something to keep in mind though for any of your projects you may be doing. So when you go to build a new construction home, you're going to use the architect set here, this floor plan, to get all of your numbers to plate your whole entire home. This is going to tell you what windows go where. We have two six five O's here. A lot of people get confused on windows and doors as well. The first number is the width of the window and the second number is the height of the window. It's not a 26 inch by 50 inch window. It's a two foot six, so 30 inches wide by 5-0 window, 60 inches tall. So the first number is always the width of the window. Second number is always the height. The easiest way to remember this is a 2668 door. It's the most common door in construction. 26 is obviously the width of the door, and 68 is always the height. You'll notice on the floor plan we're looking at here that there's no structural members listed. The architect puts everything together in a way that looks great. The engineer comes in behind and backs everything up with the structural members needed to make it withstand any sort of weather that can come at it. If you guys take one thing away from this video, please let it be that architects make things look great and the engineer simply makes things work. You'll see here on this architectural floor plan that we've got, they have the island laid out, the pantry, the stove, the refrigerator, the whole kitchen's laid out. You can see everything. There's no structural members listed because the architect's job is not to tell you how to build it but what would look best? That's exactly what we have here. Now, if you look at these side by side, you will see that they are exact mirrors of each other since it is a duplex project. Both of the kitchens are exact same layout, garage, stairs, everything else as well. Let's move on to the upper floor plan. On the upper floor plan here, you can see that they are exactly the same as well from the master bath to the guest bath, walk-in closets, stairs, everything. There's not a whole lot we need to talk about as far as the upper floor plan. Lists the same exact things as the lower, shows you where everything's going to be and gives you an idea of layout. There will be quite a few different callouts from the architect showing you different wall assemblies. Here is the exterior bearing wall fire rated. We did that on the walls that were closest to the block wall and the other property line. We're going to keep on moving forward. We are on page A5 here. This is the exterior elevations. This is a great page. There's a lot to know. There's a lot to do on this page as well. So now let's check this out. We're on the exterior elevations. This is a very important page. There's a lot to do on it. Um, a lot of things that we do prior to rough framing. This is going to show you what the building's going to look like from the outside. This is perfect for anybody that's just getting started because when I tell you 
that you're going to have a 10 foot tall structure with a 6 and 12 pitch gable and trusses and board and bat and siding some of you guys might not be able to take that and picture what it's going to look like and that's what exterior elevations is going to do for you. Along with that it's going to give you information on your wall height which is great and what the building should look like when you're completed. If the building doesn't look like the exterior elevations when you're done with it, you might have done something wrong. When you're a contractor and you've been bidding projects for a bit, you're going to have quite a few projects to bid every single year. For every 10 projects you're probably going to have a 20% success rate you'll land two out of 10 projects. With that being said, if you bid 10 projects in a month or two months, you don't want to be spending six to eight hours bidding each one of those projects. You should be able to go through them pretty quick based off of a couple different variables. We'll talk about this in a future video. This is one of those things that I like to fast track and that is figuring out my siding material. I can do it with ease. I have my rectangle tool here set up on square footage. You're just gonna go through click and drag all the way through. We have 567 square feet there, 324 there. And then on the gable ends, all you have to do is go from the center down, out and over. Because if you were to flip that side of the gable end onto there, it would make a perfect rectangle. So with that being done, we have 1137 square feet of siding just for that wall right there. The whole side would be complete. You go up to the top here, you can do the same exact thing. Take the back. Now we're at 1900, we're at 2000 square feet to do the side and the back of the unit. Here in the center of elevations, there's quite a bit of different info, such as the four inch concrete slab with number three bar at 24 on center. That will also be listed on the foundation plan. They list it here as well. There's all sorts of info here. The main thing that I use the exterior elevations for is figuring out my siding and then figuring out my walls. And what I mean by that is when you looked at the floor plan, that first page that we took a look at, did you have any idea how tall the walls were? Probably not. It's listed in a few different areas, but the elevations is one of the first places I go to to confirm my wall heights. So you can see here on the back it says 9 foot. There's a little break right there for the floor system and then 9 foot again up to top plate. So I can tell you right off the bat there that I have a 9 foot first floor and I have a 9 foot second floor. Let's jump into the part where people start to really get confused. I want to cover a bit of everything on this and you guys can actually flip through and watch this home be built. So you can go through the plans with me here and then go back and watch the videos of the home actually being built which is great. On site learning. I want to run through the section that I love the most, the section that I understand the most because this is where I truly get excited. We have the engineering side of things, the numbers, the math, the fun. We're on the lower floor plan for rough framing and it might look cluttered. It's, let's be real, it's absolutely cluttered. So we're now on the engineering side of things, the lower roof framing plan and the floor plan. There's a lot more going on here and you can see that the kitchen's not laid out the same way it was on the architectural set. And it's a lot more numbers. There is a ton of different numbers listed everywhere, and it's kind of hard to understand what exactly they mean. If you're doing the rough framing on a project, I highly suggest before you do anything on the structural set of plans, go to the framing notes. Read that from top to bottom. That's what's up on the screen right now. If you guys want to pause it, please go through and read each and every one of them. This is going to give you guys so many answers on things that I get questions on quite frequently. Number one, all headers above openings shall be a minimum of six by eight dug fir number one at two by six dug fir stud walls, unless otherwise noted. UON is unless otherwise noted. What that means is that if there is not a call out for a different header, a six by eight needs to be there. All interior non-bearing headers shall be four by eight dug fir number two or six by eight if it's a two by six wall. That already starts answering questions because I know now when I go to order all my headers for my interior doors, my exterior windows, everything else, I need to either have a 4x8 or a 6x8. And if you guys remember when this place was being built, there was a lot of 6x8. We'll run through a couple more of these just to explain them to you. All top plates to have a 48 inch minimum lap at splices with 14 16 Ds staggered per lap connection. Nails shall be installed vertically, perpendicular to top plate. Do not install nails at an angle. A lot of you guys have made comments when we go to stitch together plates because we have 
that four foot lap right there and it gets nailed like crazy. That right there is that detail, the 1416 Ds. Number three, all lumber should be identified with the grade mark and stamped at the grading association, covering the species and under whose grading rules the lumber was produced. This just means you can't mill your own lumber and put it up on a structure that is being engineered. Sounds like you can though if you own a stamp. There's a lot more that you could read through here that's going to give you a basic rundown of what you have going on this project. That is definitely where you need to start out at. Now once you're done reading through that, you can actually start diving into what we have here and it can get a little bit confusing. We're going to have another video up where we fully dive into just structural engineering and talk about every single one of these notes that they've got here. All of these little symbols, what they mean, what they go to. Let's talk about a couple things though real quick. I want to show you guys the shear walls, the shear wall schedule, and grid lines. We'll talk about that in just a second though. You can see a ton of different numbers in either a square or a circle with a call out. We have triangles listed on here as well. So you can see these dashed lines are on the exterior walls here. It starts over here on what looks to be a post with the number three and then another post over here with the number three. That shows you that you have a shear wall running from there to there. And then you can see a total length up here of 10 foot four. And then under that, a one in a triangle. We're gonna go ahead and mark this. I have my count items tool up here selected. We're going to go through and mark each individual one. That way we can keep track of them. We have a one there. That's a five wall right there. We'll get to that in a bit, talk about that. We have a one wall here. We have a one wall there. They're on the outside, that's a five. We have a six back here, a six here, a one there. Here's a two. So we have, there's another one. So we have all of our one walls selected. Now what exactly does that mean? Well, everything listed on the engineer's plans is going to have some sort of call out. Up here at the shear wall schedule, you can see we have a one and a triangle. This tells you everything. Reading a set of construction documents like this, there's a lot to look into. The shear walls that we just selected, the little triangle with a one, that represents a number one shear wall. It has the shear force right there. It has the material that it needs to be, 15 30 seconds OSB. Two sides means is it a single sided shear wall or a double sided shear wall? We did have a couple doubles. It shows you the nailing. We have eight D's at a six and 12 pattern. So we're using eight D nails six around the perimeter, 12 in the field. You have your top plate connections. You have a roof boundary clip at 18 inch on center or an LTP four at 24 inches on center. If you're building on a subfloor, this sill plate nails at subfloor is a 16 D. So you would nail six inches on center with 16 Ds from the sill plate down into the subfloor below. And then anchor bolts, five eighths up there, anchor bolt, at foundation, 48 inches on center. This tells us that we need to have our anchor bolts every 48 inches on center during these shear walls. And you can see we have number two wall, three wall, four wall, five wall, six, and seven for our shear walls. There's seven different shear walls listed there. Are we gonna have all of them on this project? Maybe, maybe not. These shear walls were calculated to get the shear values needed for the structural engineer to give this building the green light. But what do all of these little circles with a letter and a number, a dash, and then a page number down below me. These are callouts to structural details. M1 up top, that is the structural detail on page D5.1. That is a structural sheet listed with a bunch of details on that page. So we could figure out what's going on right there by going to page D5.1 and looking at that M1 detail. There is a lot of details in these plans, but they show you exactly what they want. So when you break down a corner of the building or one wall of the building by going through and looking at these details it's not so hard to build we'll talk more about that in a future video where we dive in and compare the real life framing to the set of plans that we have here i did document quite a bit of the structural engineering on that house so i can show you guys what it looks like as a detail and then what it looks like on paper all of these circles with an r1 and d5.1 those are all structural callouts to a detail on a different page. Let's look at one real quick. Then we're gonna come back and focus on grid lines. So D5.1, Q1. So here is page D5.1, and we're going to go to Q1. This had something to do with the stairs. It was right about the stair stringers. 
So here we have Q1 stair stringer connection. That detail pointing to that set of stair stringers right there wants us to look at this and it shows that the TGI floor joists are per plan. It shows that they want hangers at joist to beam connection. They want two inch and three quarter by 14 microlam LVL 2.0s. They show that we want an inch and three quarter by 14 microlam for stair stringers as well. And then they show the connection from the stair stringers to the double LVL head out that we have. It all might look pretty hectic to you guys, and it, it will for quite some time until you really get the hang of it. But once you realize that all of these simply show you how to build it, it's like putting together a very large Lego set. So what I like to do when we first start a project is obviously read through everything I've told you to read through so far. I go through and label all of our shear walls. If we have a paper set of plans, I'll highlight them. If I'm using Connex, I will go through and label everything with color here to where I know once we're on site, if I've got the iPad out, what is what. It seems people don't talk about revisions or RFIs all that often. We have problems depending on the project. So what happens when you have a project and something isn't working out the way it should? Let's just say that you have issues at a certain location. You need to be able to talk with the architect or the engineer that drew up the set of plans and depending on what you're having issues with, whether it be architectural or structural, you'll reach out to either the architect or the structural engineer. Let's just say we have a problem with engineering. Let's say that in the center of the building here, things aren't working out. Let's make up a fake example real quick and run through how you would go about talking to the structural engineer and figuring out the issues. The shear wall runs through. We're not sure which shear wall needs to run through. Obviously, we could look at it and figure it out. But say it was a gray area. Let's just make it up here. You're not sure which shear wall needs to run through. You're confused on what needs to happen. Instead of just guessing, because guessing gets you absolutely nowhere, we need to figure out how to communicate to the engineer where we're having a problem. This is our issue right in here. This section right here. What are we going to do? Are you going to tell him that the, the dividing wall in the center there, along with the other 2x6 wall that runs into it, we're not sure exactly what's going on there. Have you guys ever played Battleship? Remember how you'd sink each other's ships using D6 and you'd sink the big long tanker? Well, that's kind of what you're doing here. You have what we call grid lines, these little blue circles. You have a 3, 2, a 1, A, D, E, B. I don't know why they're not in order there. A, B, C, D makes sense. But anyways, you have A, D, E, B. These are called grid lines, and they're used to basically pinpoint, just like playing Battleship, where you have a problem. So if you had an issue, you would reach out to your structural engineer and let him or her know, I have an issue at grid line 3 and D. And they could go from 3 out to where D crosses it, and they're pinpointed directly on that spot. If what you're referencing is in between a couple of grid lines, you would just tell them in between grid line 2 and 3, and they would know it is somewhere in here. Those grid lines are going to help you in the case you need to communicate with your architect or engineer. The lower floor plan and the upper floor plan on structural engineering's plans are going to look a lot alike. You're going to have multiple pages that look like this that explain exactly what you're going to be doing. This is why when I say that building homes is essentially putting together a very large Lego set, it's true. You're, you're putting together something that's already been figured out. You don't have to guess on anything. You don't have to hope that it's right. Everything you need to know is labeled on these plans. A lot of the times though people become rushed and don't read all the way through everything and that's where mistakes are made because things get missed. I've missed a lot of things over the years because you simply overlook it. The cool part about the program that we're using right now, Connex, is that once you mark things up they stay there. You don't ever have to do it again. So I can go through here on my computer right now and mark out all of the hold downs that I need. And a month from today I can go back and look at all those hold down marks that I've got and know that we have enough of them. Why? Because I have a count on here. Now that we've gone through the plan set a little bit, you understand what pages you have, the title sheet, who's involved on the project, all that. I want to show you a reason that I use Connex for a lot of this stuff because working on a computer or working on my iPad is something that I do quite a bit on projects. Being able to accurately do things saves us not only time but saves us money as well. All of the hold downs are found on the hold down key. Triangles are HDU2, squares are HDU4s, Circles are HDU8, so let's go back to that page. I want to run you guys through it and show you how quick you could do a takeoff on something like that to prepare for a foundation. So we have the count tool set up there. 
we have HDU2 selected right now. Those are the triangles. And we're just going to run through one, two, three, four, all the way through and hit every single one of them. There was a lot of hold down on this project for being little. So all those are selected. Let's switch to HDU4s. Just there and there. Last one, HDU8s. So for HDU8s, I need six of them. For HDU4s, I need two of them. For HDU2s, I need 24. So just like that, we figured out over $1,000 in material in less than 30 seconds. We know that it's accurate. We know that we have everything marked out. You can do that with anything. All your strapping that needs to be done on the side of the building, all of your hold downs, all your big structural members, six by six, everything that's expensive, I highly suggest going through and marking out like this. This is a lead up to what we're gonna be doing next time, which is framing bidding. I'm gonna show you guys what I look for in a project like this, the different variables that change our pricing from bottom dollar to top dollar and everything in between. By the end of that video, you'll be able to understand how we bid projects and practically do it yourself. There's not a whole lot of content creators here on YouTube or any platform that are sharing how to bid and how to win projects. And while things are different in every area, there are variables you need to look out for. That's the video we're going to be working on next with Connex, so stay tuned for that. It's coming out next month. I'm going to break down our bidding process, show you exactly what goes into how we bid, and then we're going to be using Connex's bidding, their proposal setup, to make our final proposal to send off to a client. The cool part is, is the project that we're going to be showing is actually a project we're bidding, so you guys will know exactly how it's done. So stay tuned for that. I'm going to go over bidding with you guys, talk to you about a few things you need to look out for, a few things that will benefit you, and much more. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. It was a lot to take in. Anytime we do these plan reading videos, it is jam-packed. There's I could sit here for hours with you and talk to you through every single thing that you could know. We would be here for a long time. The thing you need to remember is you're never going to master plan reading. You can understand everything you're doing, but no matter what, you're still going to have questions here and there, whether it be on something simple or something completely insane. On every project we do, people are always bouncing questions back and forth because it's good to get another set of eyes on the plans. Keep in mind though that the people that are reading these plans have been doing it for 5, 10, 15 years and they still have questions. All right guys, that's a wrap. Thank you for watching today's video. I hope you took something away from it. If you did, please consider giving a thumbs up down below. Subscribe button's down there as well. If you'd like to reference the duplex project, the plans that we were reading today, links in the description down below for the whole entire build series. You can watch it from foundation to rough framing being complete. Keep an eye out, there will be a video on that project as well, an update showing you where it's at today. We're going to be back and forth with that project for a bit, wrapping up siding and more. But that's it for now, I'll see you guys next time. Bang on.